Coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. We're, we're examining that exact question. What's the relationship between the amount of discretionary time individuals have and their satisfaction? And we conducted a bunch of studies, including one where we analyzed data from the American Time Use Survey, which captures for tens of thousands of working and non-working Americans how they spent a day. And it also has a question of their life satisfaction. And what we did was we looked at the relationship. So we calculated for each individual how much time they spend on discretionary activities that day and their life satisfaction. And the results showed an interesting pattern. It showed- Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion Struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 185 of Passion Struck, recently ranked by Apple as one of the top three alternative health podcasts. And thank you, each and every one of you who comes back weekly to listen and learn how to live better, be better, and impact the world. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for being here, or you would just like to introduce this to a friend or family member. We now have episode starter packs both on the Passion Struck website as well as Spotify. These are collections of our fans' favorite episodes that we organize into topics to give new listeners a great way to get acquainted to everything we do here on the show. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. In case you missed my interviews from last week, they included Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, who's a professor at the University of South Florida and one of the foremost experts in the world on ketosis. And we do a deep dive on that topic the science of metabolism, and the keys to a keto diet. And I also had on Dr. Abby Medcalf, who's an expert in relationships. So if you're needing some advice in that space, that's a great episode to check out as well. And my solo episode from last week was on how do you make the best use of your time? Check them all out. And if you love any of them, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review. They go such a long way in helping us increase the popularity of the show and exposing it to new listeners. Now, let's talk about today's guest. Cassie Holmes is a professor at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. She is the world's leading authority on time and happiness. In her groundbreaking book, Happier Hour, How to Beat Distraction, Expand Your Time, and Focus on What Matters, which is a Forbes 22 must read, and we're releasing it as part of this podcast today. Cassie shares her cutting edge research, guiding readers on how to immediately enrich their lives by better investing the time that they have, no matter how time poor they may feel. And in our interview, we discuss the concept of time poverty, what it is and why it's damaging. Why, if you have less than two hours of free time or more than five, you're less likely likely to feel satisfied with your life. We go into that in-between point between those two and five hours, why it's the sweet spot and how most of us can achieve it. The importance of focusing on time rather than money and how it increases happiness by teaching you to use your time deliberately. How unhappy activities can be made less painful by reframing them and so much more. Thank you for choosing Passion Struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to creating an intentional life. Now, Let that journey begin. So excited to welcome Dr. Cassie Holmes to the Passion Struck Podcast. Welcome, Cassie. Thank you. It's so fun to have the opportunity to talk with you, John. Well, I'm ecstatic for you to be here, especially since we're launching your brand new book. I can't even imagine how that must feel for you. So congratulations. Thank you. I am absolutely thrilled after a whole career of research and two years of writing for this opportunity to increase happiness in people's lives by sharing these insights on how they folks should invest their time. So I am absolutely thrilled for the sort of next bit of the journey to spread happiness. 
Well, I really enjoyed the book and I'm going to have our video person put a picture of it up so anyone who's watching on YouTube can see it. In the book, you start out by going into how you went down this journey to study happiness and time. And I was going to ask a question along these lines. We all have moments that define us. Can you tell me about that moment that shaped you and your decision to move to California, join UCLA, because that was not your initial path? Yeah. As I start the book, actually, this fateful night, earlier in my career, when I was on the faculty at Wharton, and I had given a talk that day in New York with a new baby at home. I had a four-month-old at home. It was one of those crazy days where you wake up in a, a hotel room and are rushing from meeting to meeting. I'm giving my presentation and with a networking dinner afterwards. And I was rushing to not miss the very last train that would get me home to my baby and my husband in Philly. I did make the train, but that night I was just exhausted. I remember sort of laying my head against the cold glass of the train window. As I was watching the houses and the sort of trees, the darkness or whiz by, I was realizing just how fast life was passing. And I just wasn't sure that I could keep up, right? Between my career, wanting to be a good partner, wanting to be a good mother, wanting to be a good friend, all the chores that were awaiting me at home. It just felt like too much. There wasn't enough time to do everything that I wanted to do, let alone to enjoy any of it along the way. I was like, okay, I was feeling time poor. And so this is something that I've been studying more recently is this time poverty, which is the acute feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it. And in that moment, I felt so time poor. I felt overwhelmed and stressed. And I was like, the solution to get more time would be to quit it all, move to quit my job, move to a slow paced island somewhere. And then sh there surely I would find happiness. And I have since done research, and I can talk about it a little bit more, where we've actually found that there is such thing as having too much time. And in fact, I wouldn't be happier if I quit and I had a whole lot more hours in my day. And what I decided on the train that night, sort of pulling a lot of things together, was not to quit, actually, and that maybe it wasn't a question of how much time we had, but really how we invest the time we have. And so while I was already studying happiness and the benefit of focusing on time rather than money as our critical resource, I realized that I needed to figure out how should we be investing the time that we have so that we can feel fulfilled, so that our days are not just overly full, but are fulfilling. And so that's been sort of driving my research since then, as well as my teaching. So I shifted from teaching traditional marketing courses to pulling the science together of happiness and time. And I've been teaching a class at Anderson at the business school here at UCLA called Applying the Science of Happiness to Life uh, Design, which is doing exactly that, sharing the science of happiness so that my MBA students can be more deliberate in how they spend their time, be informed in how they spend their time so that they feel happier in their days and more satisfied in the longer trajectory of their career and lives. Well, what a name for a course. And <laughs> I got to believe it's probably one of the most popular on campus. Who wouldn't want to take that class? It is among the most popular. And I <laughs> hope that it's not just because people think it'll be easy, but it is, in fact, impactful and valuable. And as I have observed and heard from my students is that it is phenomenally helpful in shifting people's attention to their time and how can they optimize not just the sort of nebulous sense of success and uh, status, but something that is more sort of sustainable and fulfilling and satisfying. Yeah, very much needed because when I was going through mine, 
and I had Max Bazerman and Don Moore on the podcast recently, that's what a lot of my curriculum was about was decision, leadership, behavioral economics, those types of things. So I would have loved to have a class like that when I was going through it. But I'm not sure the listeners know what a social psychologist is. So I was hoping that you could discuss that, but also what you mean by saying that you conduct me search. <laughs> yes. So a social psychologist, it is understanding how the situations and the environment influence us as individuals and the decisions we make, our judgments and decision making. And the outcome that I'm most interested in is how we feel, how satisfied we feel in those choices, how happy we feel more generally, and the extent to which we feel meaning in our lives. So as a social psychologist. So on when I talk about that fateful night on the train, and I had that question of, if I quit my job and had a whole lot more time, would I be happier? This was an empirical question that I could answer and had the training as a social psychologist to answer to understand the situation. If one had a little time or a lot of discretionary time, how does it influence how people feel? And so this spurred work that I conducted with Hal Hirschfield and Marissa Sharif, where we were examining that exact question, what's the relationship between the amount of discretionary time individuals have and their satisfaction? And we conducted a bunch of studies, including one where we analyzed data from the American Time Use Survey, which captures for tens of thousands of working and non-working Americans, how they spent a day. And it also has a question of their life satisfaction. And so we wanted to calculate for each individual, how much time did they spend on discretionary activities? And you might be like, well, what counts as a discretionary activity? Since we didn't want to be the ones to determine what counts as discretionary or not, what we did was we presented all of the activities to another sample of um, Americans, and we pre-registered that we would count any activity, being very conservative, that more than 90% agreed was discretionary. So it was time spent for the purpose of pleasure or another intrinsically worthwhile uh, purpose. So it's basically, what are those activities that people want to do versus a obligatory time, so things that people have to do. And what we did was we looked at the relationship. So we calculated for each individual how much time they spend on discretionary activities that day and their life satisfaction. And the results showed an interesting pattern. It showed an upside down U shape, sort of like an arc or a rainbow. And so on one side, it captured the unhappiness of us time poor people that when we have too little time, yes, we do feel unhappy and that happens to be driven by greater feelings of stress. What was interesting was that on the other side, you also saw low levels of happiness that there was such thing as having too much time digging into that effect. So this was telling me that actually maybe I wouldn't be so happy if I quit everything and had too much time. Why? The answer is that when people have too much discretionary time, and particularly if they spend that discretionary time in ways that don't feel fulfilling or worthwhile, that more sort of passive leisure, that people feel a lacking sense of purpose, that we are averse to being idle, that when we have hours and hours that we spend with nothing to show for how we spent that time, then we feel, again, uh, that we're sort of unproductive, we don't have a sense of purpose and are therefore dissatisfied. And so this is informative in lots of ways. A, it informed me that I shouldn't quit my job. But it also informs <laughs> when people have a lot of time available to them, how should they actually spend that time? And it's not that retirees are necessarily less satisfied. Actually, you see that when retirees spend their time in ways that feel worthwhile, like volunteering, for instance, like engaging in an enriching hobby, then you actually, or even actually connecting, social connection, you don't see this drop off in the sort of too much time effect. So 
that is a type of question and that's totally driven by me search. So me search being, I personally am grappling with a question in this case, should I quit my job? And how would I feel if I had a whole lot more time? And taking those questions, testing them among a broader sample of individuals, hopefully through random assignment, so you can see the effects of one situation for the versus another. But in other cases, you can look at patterns within existing data to look at what is the relationship between particular variables. Okay, well, I think a great follow-on question to that is then how does the quality of happiness change as we grow older? Yes, and this was another me search driven question that we were looking to answer. And it was spurred actually by a conversation that I had with Amit Bhattacharji, who was a PhD student at the time. And this was in Philly. We happen to live in the same neighborhood. And one Monday morning, we ran into each other as we we're walking into the office. And he was like, very gracious, how was your weekend? And I was oozing with sort of delight and happiness. I was like, it was amazing. And he was like, what did you do? And basically I did a lot of nothing. I had a lovely weekend walking around the neighborhood with my now toddler at the time, my four month old <laughs> grew older and my husband. And we went out for brunch. We strolled the neighborhood. We watched a movie and it, wasn't very extraordinary, but I was absolutely happy that Monday and then sort of embarrassed after relaying my super happy weekend. I was like, how was your weekend? And he was like, it was amazing. He had gone to New York and gone to a concert with his like college friends and at the face of it, not at the face of it, authentically, both of us were very happy from our weekends. But the question was with my very ordinary weekend, his very extraordinary weekend, which experiences do lead to greater happiness? And so we wanted to understand whether the extraordinary experiences or ordinary experiences lead to greater happiness. And so that is another question that we brought to data. And in that, we initially asked hundreds of individuals across the country, tell us about a recent experience that made you happy. We asked some to tell us about an ordinary experience others to tell us about an extraordinary experience. And the types of experiences that people generated made me even happy reading them. So the extraordinary experiences tended to be sort of life milestones, getting married, having a baby, graduation, getting a new job, or amazing vacations, going to Paris, diving the blue hole in Belize, or actually cultural experiences like a meets going to an amazing concert. The ordinary happy experiences that people recollected looked very much like my weekend, where it was these simple moments shared with loved ones, whether with friends, family, a pet, treats, so enjoying a glass of wine or a delicious sandwich, or actually noticing your environment, noticing the weather outside, a sunset, a sunrise, and in terms of the happiness that they generated, not only did we ask people to tell us about their experience, but also just how happy it made them. What we found was that the answer depended on age. So among the younger individuals, they experienced greater happiness from the extraordinary compared to the ordinary. What was interesting was among the older participants, they experienced as much happiness from the ordinary as from the extraordinary. And it isn't young versus old. It's as people get older, you see an increasing happiness from simple moments. And in follow-on studies that we conducted, it suggests that it's not about age per se of how old you are. It's about how much time you feel like you have left in your life. So younger people tend to view their futures as expansive. As people get older, they recognize that in fact, their futures are more limited. And in recognizing just how limited one's time is, you recognize how precious all of your time is. And so those even simple moments gain a greater sort of value and draw your attention. And so we found that actually when we led younger people to recognize that their time left in life is actually finite, then you see that they are more apt to enjoy wonderful levels of happiness, high levels of happiness from even these simple ordinary moments that are right there in front of us, available to us 
in our day-to-day -day life. And this is sort of stepping outside of the research, but you can absolutely understand why in the last couple of years, as we have experienced this pandemic, it is leading all of us, no matter how young or old we are, to recognize that indeed, our time in life is finite. We're seeing people savoring those ordinary moments, paying attention in those, the day-to-day -day and extracting greater joy from those moments. Well, I think that that's a great answer and it's a great lead in to this next topic I wanted to go down, which is this podcast is all about how do you live intentionally? And I think as I read Happier Hour, the whole lens of the book is about being intentional. And I love this quote from chapter three of the book, and I was going to read it. And you write, apart from the large influence of our personalities and the surprisingly small influence of our circumstances, a hefty chunk of our happiness is determined by our intentional thought and behavior. What this means is that our happiness is significantly influenced by what we deliberately think about and do. And my question, because I thought it was such a powerful quote, is why do those who place more intentional focus on their time rather than money, report feeling more positive in their days and more satisfied about their lives. Yeah, and the answer is absolutely in line with your broader thesis around intentionality. When we pay attention to time as our critical resource, that leads us to be more thoughtful, more deliberate in how we spend it. Spending in ways that are closer and more aligned with our values. So we become more deliberate with how we spend our time. Touching back to some of my very early research where I was looking at the effect of focusing on time versus money. What I found was simply those who are chronically more focused on time versus money or value their time very highly are happier. <laughs> and that is controlling for how much time they have, which you can measure by age, you can measure by how many hours they work per week. It's also controlling for how much money they have, which you can measure by income level. And what it's picking up on is that those who value time are happier because they are more deliberate in how they invest it. Now going to the quote that you read, it's like, okay, so we need to be deliberate Happiness is a choice. So yes, there are inputs into our happiness that we don't have control over. So our inherited disposition has a big effect actually on our happiness. So were you born as sort of naturally half glass, half full type person, or are you sort of more of a natural grunt? And this is the effects of our inherited disposition are quite large. And then there's those circumstances. So things that are in our life that we don't have control over, like income level, like a level of attractiveness, marital status. Yes, you can decide to get married, but these are sort of circumstantial factors that you don't have sort of daily influence over. Those are things that actually have a significantly smaller effect than people think. Because so, so many individuals think that if only I had a ton of money, if only I were super gorgeous, if only I had like that huge fancy house, then I will be happier. The research shows that, yes, sometimes those have an initial effect, but that effect is much smaller than we think. And I actually spend the first sort of two classes in my course, I'm trying to sort of remaking that point that these things that we think are the sort of secrets to happiness have less of an influence than we think. And then the part that I am really interested in is that part that we do have control over that sort of remaining variance <laughs> in our happiness. And that is how we think and how we behave. And that's where the science comes in because Yes, it's about intentionality, but even if I want to be intentional, there's still the question of like, okay, well then what should I be doing? And there is work that can inform how should we be spending our time? There is time tracking research that tracks individuals over the course of their day. What are they doing and how do they feel while doing it? And so that we can look at on average, what are those activities that tend to be associated with higher levels of happiness? What are those activities that tend to be associated with the most negative emotion? You see that the activities that on average are associated with the 
sort of contribute to the greatest amount of happiness or social connection. So spending time with family and friends, those activities that tend to, <laughs> on average, are associated with the least amount of happiness are commuting, work, and housework. So getting to work, getting home from work, work itself, and doing work when you get home. But notably, that research is based off of averages. And so an exercise that I have my students do and I walk through in great detail in happier hour is so helpful because and it's basically having you tracking your own time. So over the course of a couple of weeks, writing down every half hour, what are you doing? But most importantly, how happy are you on a scale of one to 10? Like overall positivity. So not just like, is it sort of pleasurable and fun, but how, how positive overall, how satisfying, how meaningful, so that you have your own personal data set and can identify, okay, what are those activities that are, for me, are the most happy? What are those activities that are the least happy? So you don't have to chunk all of work together because there's going to be some work activities that are more positive, some work activities that are more negative. There are going to be some social activities that are more positive. There are going to be some social activities that are more negative. And so you can pull out what are actually the features underlying those activities that can inform, given that our happiness is also a choice of how we spend our time, is it can inform those activities that we spend our time on. Well, I like in chapter three, how you went through the study that identified kind of three segments of how we spend our time, happy time, meh time, <laughs> and then the wasted time. And I went through your time tracking exercise myself. Oh, you and did? I'm, Yay. Yes. And I'm going to have you, you find? Well, I found that if I would have taken it four or five years ago, I would have been spending much more of my time on either moi or wasted time, but that now I feel much more fulfilled about what I'm spending the majority of my time in. And I think a big part of it is a lot of my professional career, I was thinking very individualistically about where I was trying to take my career and the accomplishments. And I think as I've gotten older, I've shifted a lot more of my view into being world-centric instead of self-centric and how I approach everything that I'm doing. And that my real purpose here is to give back and to help. For me, it's the big thing about trying to address as much human suffering as possible while bringing more joy to the world. And I think since I've kind of built my life through that intention, it's definitely changed my time parameters and also where I don't want to be wasting it. Yeah. A, that's wonderful. Where you're spending your time is fulfilling. And that's an interesting part of this, the sort of results of you doing your own personal time tracking. Not only does it allow you to identify which activities are the most worthwhile and fulfilling and which are those that feel wasteful, but it also allows you to see where you're spending your time. So how much time are you spending on these various activities and touching back to this notion of time poverty and that feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it. Oftentimes when people do this exercise, they realize just how much time they are spending in wasteful ways that are not <laughs> contributing to anything. Oftentimes for my students, this sort of pops up with screen time, whether it is on social media, screen time on their little phones, or watching TV. And not that those activities in themselves are bad, but when you look at their ratings of their own personal ratings of how happy they felt doing it, when you see that they're people feel so busy that they don't have time to spend on those activities that they give nines and tens to meeting up with a friend for dinner after work. It's like, oh, I don't have time for that. Yet that, those are the activities that give the sort of contribute most to or sort of produce the greatest happiness. But then they're spending hours and hours watching TV. The ratings are sort of at the meh level, <laughs> a middling five, for instance. But recognizing just how much time you might be spending on that, then with this information, it's wonderful because then you know what time you can reallocate and where you should reallocate it on what activities you should reallocate them. I think that's great. And in chapter one, you talk a lot about what Brene Brown's calls 
scarcity. And I wanted to ask you, how does being time poor limit not only the quality of our lives, but the quality of our relationships and our ability to give time to others? Being time poor is bad. It has these negative effects. It makes us less healthy, less kind, and less confident and less happy. The less kind is that when we feel time poor, we are less likely to spend time on others, to take the time to help another out or to even spend time with another with the, our sort of full attention on them. Interestingly, we have work with Zoe Chance and Mike Norton where we found a sort of counterintuitive effect where despite the fact that when we feel time poor, we are less likely to give time to others, when you do, it can actually make you feel like you have more time. And that might sound surprising, but the reason is that when we spend time to help others, it makes us feel really effective and recognizing, oh my gosh, I can accomplish a lot. I did accomplish a lot with my time. I can accomplish a lot with my time. And if you recall, the definition of time poverty is this feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it. So underlying that is this sense of confidence that you can complete what you set out to do with the time that you have. And by spending time on others, increasing your sense of self-efficacy, it actually makes you more confident that you can accomplish a lot with the time you have. And all of a sudden, that time feels less limiting. And it increases your sense of time affluence, which is wonderful because then it's like this wonderful virtuous cycle. Then you feel less constrained. Then you are more open and willing to engage and help out others. One of my favorites, so in my course, Applying the Science of Happiness to Life Design, each week I give my students an assignment, sort of an experiential assignment. So one of the assignments is the time tracking exercise, which I shared with you. Another is doing random acts of kindness. So doing something for someone else, and I have them actually do two, one for someone that they don't know and one for someone that they do know, an act of kindness, and then I have them reflect on how did that make them feel. And interestingly, even though this is an investment of time, in many cases, to do something nice for someone else, what it made them feel is very accomplished and very satisfied and actually like they had more time, again, reducing that overall sense of constraint and limitation from this particular resource. So I love that assignment because then not only spreading niceness for those weak among my students, but just seeing how it sort of perpetuates them to do more niceness, right? And then it makes the recipients of the niceness like go and do nice things for others. Well, I think I want to stay on this scarcity topic just a little bit longer. Earlier this year, I got to interview both uh, David Vago, who's a professor at Vanderbilt, and Dr. David Yaden, who you might know because your times crossed when you were at uh, Penn. But he's now at Johns Hopkins. Both of them are two of the foremost experts in the world on self-transcendence. And in fact, David Yaden wrote a paper with Dr. Vago and Martin Slugman and Jonathan Haidt about characterizing a new framework for it. And one of the things you bring up in the book is awe and that when we experience awe, it can help us with these feelings of scarcity. What are some what ways that you recommend doing that? Yeah, and that is, it's a wonderful link. And based off of research by Jennifer Ocker, Kathleen Boss, and Melanie Red, they looked specifically at that of how does it, ha, having an experience of awe influence sense of time, time affluence? Now on the flip side, time scarcity. And what they found was that those who have even reminded of an experience of awe makes people feel more time affluent. It limits that sense of constraint. What are some sort of nice opportunities to experience awe? One is through social connection. So having that deep engagement and interaction um, with another human being. And you can think that sort of feeling when you hold a baby, it's just that, that 
intense um, sense of connection. You can find it through others' accomplishment and creativity. So through art. In the book, I mentioned my awe from sort of hearing about one of my colleagues' research, Andrea Guess who won the Nobel Prize for her work in discovering a supermassive black hole. So she's in the sciences. And that was just an extraordinary feat that instilled a sense of awe in me. Nature. So getting outside and exposing yourself to the immensity, the enormity of the world around us and the beauty in it can also evoke a sense of awe. Even if you don't get these sort of experiences of awe are, they're not impossible to attain, but they are hard to attain. But actually getting outside and exposing yourself to nature has more immediate effects too. There's work that shows the role of moods simply being outside. And yes, it's better if it's nice weather. Yes, it's better if you're in a natural environment versus an urban environment. But even with those features, I'm sort of pulling out the influence of those features, simply getting outside without having a roof over your head makes people feel happier. It lightens their mood. And to the extent that you experience awe, then it will also expand your sense of time. Well, one of the things I try to do to incorporate more of it in my life is I get up very early in the morning and go on a walk most days about 5 a.m. with my dog. And I can't tell you how many incredible things I've seen in the sky and just experienced on those walks, especially when I'm taking a break from a podcast, I'm just trying to be totally into sensing what's around me and being deliberate about mindfulness. You just get this peace at that time in the morning that I don't find in the hustle around us, which gives you a much greater ability to absorb all that. So that would be a tip to a a listener as well of a, a way to experience it. Unlike self-transcendence experiences, which happen much less frequently, there are ways that you can experience awe as you're explaining much more in your daily lives. Yeah, absolutely. As you mentioned, in your walk that's outside, there's so many benefits of that. A, you're outside in the sort of the quietness of the morning, which allows you to notice what's around you. So there's the sort of meditative aspect, there's the awareness aspect, the mindfulness aspect. But another thing is that you're moving your body. And so (laughs) exercise, this is another activity that increases happiness, mood, and I hypothesize through increasing a sense of self-efficacy, also time affluence. And so for me, it sounds like you go on walks with your dog early in the morning. For me, it is my early morning run. And it's sadly, exercise is one of these things that we tend not to do when we feel busy. And when I feel particularly busy, I'm like, oh, I don't have time to go for a run tomorrow morning. But that is the wrong choice because exercise has been shown to increase sense of self-esteem, self-efficacy, and actually an immediate sort of mood booster. And that mood booster like translates over into sort of subsequent activities in your day by increasing that self-efficacy. As I mentioned, in the effect of giving time to others makes you feel like you have more time because it increases self-efficacy. Same with exercise. So by coming home from that run, I'm like, oh my gosh, I did it. Like, and I can do it and I can do anything. It's like, again, that sense of limitation, that time constraint tends to sort of cloud our experience that gets lessened so that we are excited and willing and capable to take on more of the things that feel worthwhile. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think another important thing that you brought up in the book was the topic of sleep. And I recently had on Dr. Sarah Mednick, who you might know, she's at uh, UCLA, Irvine expert on really the power of the nap. And now she has a book called The Downstate. And she is well brought up in our interview, just how integral our sleep patterns are to our overall happiness. I was hoping for the audience, maybe you could just give them a couple links to it as well, because you carve out probably a third of a chapter just discussing it. Yeah. And so, as I mentioned in the assignments that I give my students over the course of the course, one of the assignments, actually, I give it the same week as I have them exercise for at least 30 minutes each day. I also have them sleep 
at least seven hours, hopefully eight, for at least four days that week so that they can experience what is the effect of sleep on their subsequent mood and their experience over the course of the week. I am not a sleep expert, but each year in my course, I have Dr. Alon Avedon, um, who is a sleep specialist at UCLA, come and talk to us and share with us. It sounds like similar, the science of sleep that Sarah Mednick shared with your listeners is exactly that. Being well-rested has amazing cognitive benefits, <laughs> but also from the thing I'm interested in is how people feel because it's a great mood booster. And actually, I think the flip side is the where the bigger effect comes from. When you feel sleep deprived, you feel crabby, mad at everyone around you. You feel less capable in yourself. And it's actually the negative effects of your mood on being sleep deprived will absolutely taint your experience over the course of all of your other activities. So it's like, even if you're super intentional and you're doing the activities or filling your days with activities that are worthwhile, if you go into those activities exhausted, then they're not going to be as enjoyable as they would be otherwise. So there is value of sleep. And again, we've talked about time poverty and I ask folks to complete this sentence. I don't have time to. And what you see is people's answers to that highlight what time poverty limits ourselves or limits from our lives and keeps us from investing in. And the answers are often, I don't have time to exercise. I don't have time to get enough sleep. And then these are you know very physiological things that we need in order to enjoy and to get the most and to be most present and to bring ourselves as best possible to our days. And then there's the other things that are very sort of disappointing that people don't have time to, so they don't have time to do, and that is invest sort of wholly in their relationships, invest in themselves by pursuing their personal passions and interests and hobbies. So yes, Time poverty limits us in so many ways, and that's why it's so important to figure out how do we lessen those constraints, lessen those limitations so that we can be more affluent, broader, bigger in our lives. And as we've already mentioned, a couple of them, experience awe, get into nature, do something for someone else, acts of kindness, as well as exercise. Well, I happen to read a research paper you did in 2021 with Colin West and Sanford DeVoy. And I thought this would be something our listeners would want to hear about as well as how do you approach happiness by treating the weekend like a vacation? Yes. And I'm glad you asked about that. This is such simple intervention that we have found can have a big effect on our happiness. So in the context of our time off, so vacation. So we as actually Americans are really bad at taking vacations. We're the only industrialized nation that doesn't have legally mandated vacations. And even though we get less vacation than many folks in other countries, we don't even take the vacation that we're given. Almost half of Americans don't take all of their paid vacation. And that's because A, vacations are expensive. And so we don't feel like we have enough money. B, we don't feel like we have enough time. So we don't feel like we can take the time away from the busyness and the routine and all of our tasks in our daily life to take that break. You should take vacation though, because it's correlated with greater happiness, satisfaction, creativity, job performance, job engagement. So you should take vacation. In addition, We did recognize that actually we do get time off each week. Most Americans get weekends off from work. Yet why does do those weekends not feel like a break? Well, because throughout the weekend, we're sort of in that routine of doing and aren't intentional and aren't really paying attention to it as a break. We're sort of getting things done, checking things off of our to-do list. And we were interested in what if we treated the weekend like a vacation. What if we treated it like the break that it can and should be? How would that affect our happiness? In particular, how would that affect our happiness when we return to work on Monday? 
And we conducted a simple experiment, which we replicated several times, where among a sample of working Americans who get the weekend off, on the Friday going into the weekend, we gave half of the, in, them the instructions, treat this weekend like a vacation. That is, to the extent possible, think and behave in ways you would on vacation. The others we told, treat this weekend like a regular weekend, to the extent possible, think and behave in ways you would on a regular weekend. That's it. They could interpret that. They could do with it what they will. They had their weekend. And then on Monday, when they returned to work, we reconnected with them, and then we measured their happiness again. And what we found was that those who treated their weekend like a vacation or were instructed to were significantly happier than those who treated it like a regular weekend. And we were curious, did they do different things or what sort of driving this effect? We did see that behavior changed a bit. So people did, those in the sort of quote unquote vacation weekend conditioner, the vacationers, they did spend a little bit more time eating, so probably at meals, less, a little bit less time doing work, a little bit less time doing housework. So these are a little bit more like vacation, but it wasn't how they spent their time that was reflected in how they felt over the weekend and how they felt on Monday morning. Instead, it was their mindset. So those who treated the weekend like a vacation were more present. They were more mentally engaged in the activities that they were doing throughout the weekend than those in the regular weekend condition. What we sort of deduce from this is that there is a vacation mindset. When we do take a break from all the doing, which is sort of running through our head, those to-do lists, it takes us out of the present moment. We're always thinking about what's next, as opposed to like recognizing that, yes, at the breakfast table on Saturday morning, be there, be paying attention. They're like, <laughs> it's a break to the extent that people experience it like a break, then you get this boost in happiness. So it's a lovely intervention because it doesn't require additional money. It doesn't require taking additional days off. Although again, you should take a vacation more than you do, but it does remind us and sort of give us the license to take the breaks from our routine and from the sort of hecticness of it all that we not only deserve, but really need to be refreshed and happy. Well, I think that's great and something I'm going to have to try to do on more of my weekends. <laughs> well, we're getting close to the end of the interview. And one of the questions I had to ask you is, how much time do we need to feel time affluent? And is there a happy hour sweet spot? In that inverted U shape that I shared with you from our analysis of the American Time Use Survey data, we saw that collapsing across individuals, those who work in that data, we saw that those with less than approximately two hours of discretionary time in their day, you see that drop off in happiness. So that's sort of the too little time. We saw that those with more than about five hours of discretionary time in their day, you saw that drop off in happiness from too much time. That suggests that there is between two and five hours, but I don't want it to be sound as concrete as that. But I think that the bigger takeaway is that there's a pretty wide range where it's not about how much time you have, except at the very extremes. It's not about how much time you have. It's how you invest that time. And as we've sort of covered over our conversation today, it's both the activities that you spend your time on, but it's also your mindset when you're spending that time, paying attention. And so it's that being intentional, both in how you spend the time as well as while you're spending the time of that sort of mindfulness and paying attention given the time that you're spending anyways. So yeah, I think that beyond thinking about a sweet spot, it's not about quantity, it's about quality in both the activities and your engagement in those activities. Well, Cassie, I think you just gave kind of a masterclass on this whole topic. I did <laughs> want to tell the more in I did hour. Wa <laughs> I wanted to tell the audience I purposely didn't go into a lot of the exercises because I think that's one of the most important things that I found in the book is each of the nine chapters has specific exercises such as the five Y test, the eulogy test, pedotic approach to your life as 
as well as other things. So I would highly encourage you to read this book. I thought it was great because we always talk about time, but this actually brings the science about this marriage of time and happiness together. So last thing I wanted to ask you is if there's one thing you hoped the reader would take away from the book, what would it be? That you have choice in how happy you feel in your days and how fulfilled you feel in your life, you can do it. It all starts, I guess, with making an hour a happier hour. And from there, everything follows. Well, great. And Cassie, if there was a way for the listeners to get to know more about you, where would you point them to? Yeah, um, my website, www.cassiecassiem homes.com that pulls a lot of it together as I talk about sort of I don't want to spend time on social media and I tell my students not to spend too much time so I'm not really on social media but my website pulls together sort of my research and where it's covered and so you can find me there okay well thank you so much for giving us the honor of being on the show and congratulations again on your incredible new book Thank you so much. This was a treat. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Cassie Holmes, and I wanted to thank Cassie, Eileen Boyle, and Gallery Books for the honor of interviewing her. Links to all things Cassie will be in the show notes at passionstruck.com. Please use our website links if you buy any of the books from the guests featured on the show. All proceeds go to keeping this show free for our listeners. Videos are at YouTube at John R. Miles. Please go there and join the 14,000 subscribers that we have. Advertiser deals and discount codes are all in one convenient place at passionstruck.com slash deals. You can find me on both Twitter or Instagram at John R. Miles, and I'm also on LinkedIn. And if you wonder how I book these amazing guests, it's because of my network. Go out there and build yours before you need it. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview I did with Jason Pfeiffer, who is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine and author of the new book, Build for Tomorrow, an action plan for embracing change, adapting fast, and future-proofing your career. We should remember that everything that we do, everything that we love, everything that we think, everything that we consume on a daily basis. At one point, new and scary to somebody else. I mean, just think about it with John Philip Sousa. He was opposed to recorded music. The phonograph has ultimately led to you and I being able to talk together right now on a podcast. Remember, we rise by lifting others. Share this show with those that you love. And if you found this episode useful, especially on time management and happiness, please share it with someone who can use the advice that we gave here today. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck.